Stuart Rochester, co-author of Honor Bound, American Prisoners of War in Southeast Asia. If someone buys your book, what do they get? Well, they get a 700-page uh, book that is both a, um, I think, a, a novel, a, a story, a narrative of the experience of the prisoners of war in, the, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and they also get an analysis, um, uh, a documented analysis of what that experience was like and um, uh, uh, how well the POWs performed, uh, not according to uh, memoir renditions, but according to records, according to uh, debriefings and uh, reports and a good deal of uh, research material that we went through over a period of almost 10 years. So it's both a, uh, I think, a fascinating story as well as a uh, comprehensive scholarly uh, analysis uh, and record of uh, the performance of the POWs and uh, uh, their uh, experience uh, uh, as well as to some extent getting into the problem of the MIAs but mainly the POW issue. Yeah. Where do you work? I work at the Pentagon. I'm in uh, the history office in the office of Secretary of Defense which is a small uh, uh, office of about uh, three full-time professional historians uh, and uh, we uh, do um, history such as this, although normally not this type of history, more often a uh, history of the, uh, the administrative history of the work and the policies of the Secretary of Defense. And uh, we also have an archival function and uh, uh, we do papers and analyses for the secretaries and for other officials in the, in the building. As a way of getting into some of the many stories you tell about torture in here, I want to read Air Force Captain Conrad Troutman 1967, an interview he gave after the homecoming. Did he give it to you all? Uh, no, Troutman's, uh, the quote from Troutman probably was in an after action report that uh, we had received, although Troutman was interviewed by my co author, uh, Fred Kiley, who, knows Tr who knew Troutman personally. Um, Troutman was one of the uh, uh, seniors uh, and one of the uh, senior ranking officers at the zoo. Uh, one of the camps that was located about three miles uh, southwest of, of Hanoi. Um, and the passage that you're referring to is one in which I think Troutman gives a good summary of the, what, of the, the torture experience, particularly the rope torture, um, in which he describes how they were literally strung uh, with their, strung up from the ceiling with their arms kind of behind their back and uh, cinched up uh, to the point where their arms, where they almost, uh, their shoulders were almost dislocated. In some cases, they would be, uh, and uh, 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 they would be put through this periodically uh, in two or three uh, sessions. Um, and it was one of the worst of the, of the tortures. Uh, some were maimed uh, in the process. Um, few got through it without giving up some information, without in some ways uh, giving the enemy what he wanted. How many prisoners of war were there during the Vietnam War? Uh, altogether about 800. Uh, there were uh, 800 at least documented cases of uh, POWs. There are a number of discrepancy cases where we're not sure if a guy was perhaps uh, captured for, uh, for a few hours. Uh, and escaped. Uh, he may have been held just very briefly, caught in an ambush and got away immediately. Some of those are, are counted on certain lists, but basically about 800 uh, altogether. Let me read Captain Conrad Troutman, 1967. Let me try to tell you what it really feels like when they tightly bind your wrists and elbows behind your back with nylon straps. Then take the strap and pull the arms up, up your back to the back of your head. If you can remember when you were a little boy, the fooling around you did, and someone grabs your hand and just twists your arm up to your back and says, say uncle. He does it with just one hand. And this, as you remember, is a very severe pain. Well, imagine this with both arms tied tight together, elbow to elbow, wrist to wrist, and then using the leverage of his feet planted between your shoulder blades with both hands, he pulls with all his might till your arms are up and back over your head, forcing your head down between your feet. 
where your legs are between iron bars. The pain is literally beyond description. One more uh, little point here. Besides the pain itself, you are tied up so tight that your windpipe becomes pinched and you breathe in gasps. You're trying to gulp in air because your wind passage is being shrunken. Your throat in a matter of 30 seconds becomes completely dry. After about 10 or 15 minutes in this position, tied up so tightly, your nerves in your arms are pinched off and then your whole upper torso becomes numb. It's a relief. You feel no more pain. The breathing is still difficult, but the pain is gone. You've been anesthetized. However, when they release the ropes, the procedure works completely in reverse. It's almost like double jeopardy. You go through the same pain coming out of the ropes as you did going right, in. Right. They all describe it very similarly, the double jeopardy aspect. Uh, the, uh, the coming out of it, uh, you experience the same thing as you're going in it. Fred Kiley, the co-author, actually went through a version of that at Fort Belvoir uh, at their survival school here in the Washington area. Uh, I declined to do it, but Fred uh, had heard so much about the rope torture that uh, just to get the feel of it, as he said, uh, actually underwent, uh, underwent it. And, uh, uh, had very much the same sensation that, that Troutman describes. By all accounts, it was the worst of the many kinds of torture that uh, they were, were sub subjected to. Um, but curiously, some managed to get through the, um, as with all things with the POWs, what some found to be uh, the, the worst case, others found to be more tolerable, and there were some who found other tortures to be more um, uh, 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 vicious and more difficult to tolerate. Uh, How many do you think went through the rope torture? Um, between 1960, the so-called middle years, which were the most difficult ones, uh, when the torture program was uh, fairly regularly practiced to extract information and uh, also for punishment purposes, most of the POWs had at least one session in, in the ropes. Uh, uh, and later on, as you get toward the end of the, the uh, captivity period closer to homecoming, fewer and fewer of them would be subjected to, to the, uh, uh, the rope torture. But there were many others. Bud Day, who, is, who won the Congressional Medal of Honor and who um, uh, was as tough a nut as anyone over there, as tough a resistor, uh, and had as much fortitude and strength as anyone, uh, Bud Day had uh, the most problem with what was called the kneeling torture, where they would simply have to kneel for long periods of time, often on a pebble or a stone. And as he said in his memoir, try that sometime for, for, for four or five hours and see what it feels like. And Day had more problems with that than with the ropes. We're showing a little bit of this picture. Uh, this was not Bud Day, it was uh, Ev Alvarez. Where is this picture and who was he? Alvarez, uh, of course, is famous as the, the so-called old man of the North. He was the first uh, pilot uh, captured uh, over North Vietnam in August of 1964. So uh, Alvarez would have been there almost a decade altogether. He came out in 1973. At this point, uh, I think we're, it's probably around 1966 or 67, Alvarez is being uh, taken through, uh, through the town. They often would take prisoners through uh, uh, on kind of a tour of either bomb, bombed out sites uh, as part of the indoctrination process. Um, they would take prisoners, uh, quote, out on the town. Uh, many of the POWs actually welcomed this as at least a change of pace from the uh, monotony of uh, uh, being in their cell for uh, all but uh, uh, 20, 22 hours a day. Uh, but Alvarez in that, in that photo shot is, is out on a, 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 one of those, I think, uh, tours around the city. Let me ask you about people that we know of because they've been in the public spotlight since then. Jeremiah Denton was a senator from Alabama for a while. Right. Uh, Denton uh, was uh, one of the top-ranking seniors. Um, he uh, was captured early in the war um, in, uh, I believe, 1965. Uh, Denton had a reputation, even among the seniors, as being one of the strictest and uh, one of the staunchest in terms of his adherence to the code of conduct and requiring that the others adhere to it. And every now and then Denton will get into some conflicts with Stockdale and Garino and some of the others who had a slightly different um, uh, interpretation of, uh, of the code. Um, but Denton was one of the toughest resistors. Um, 
He uh, was certainly one of the most admired POWs. Uh, he's the one who gives, he's the first one off the, first senior off the aircraft at homecoming and gives the uh, address on the tarmac at Clark Air Base where he says, God bless America. And what, did he, what did he have to do with the tapping code? Uh, Denton's contribution to so-called tap code, the tap code was a system whereby the POWs communicated and, and Denton contributed an important new uh, nuance or aspect, uh, the so-called vocal tap code, whereby prisoners would be able to communicate not just by a, a tapping on the wall, but through coughing or sneezing, and which was very important because it was very easy to disguise that form of communication in a climate, in an environment in which everyone had either uh, uh, some form of malaria or some kind of, of um, uh, coughing uh, uh, some kind of uh, either lung disease uh, from the uh, chill of the winter or the dampness. And so these places sounded like tuberculosis wards anyway, uh, the, the various compounds, but they were often co coughing in a certain code that Denton had, had developed. There is a current Federal Trade Commissioner by the name of Orson Swindle, who used to run the Ross Perot campaign at one point. Right. What was his role? Uh, Swindle uh, was uh, another uh, one who was uh, would be considered a hard liner. Um, he was a Marine. Um, uh, there are not uh, as many Marines who were captured as uh, naval aviators, of course, or, or Air Force uh, airmen. Uh, but Swindle was one of the more more prominent POWs in this middle period. Uh, underwent a good deal of torture. Um, he's one of those who um, uh, was a master of. Uh, uh, what's called the fuck you look uh, that he would give the Vietnamese. He took absolutely no quarter from their guards. Uh, he would be, um, again, when he was, he'd have to rate, I think, as one of the toughest uh, resistors. And of course, when he came out, uh, became active in politics and eventually in the Perot campaign. Congressman Sam Johnson of Texas. Yeah. Johnson, uh, another one, you're, you're, you're going through what are considered many of the uh, 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 toughest uh, POWs, uh, most courageous, and uh, ones who would, were able to withstand torture and interrogation uh, uh, as well as anyone. Johnson uh, was a Air Force major uh, and one of those who ended up at Alcatraz. Alcatraz was considered the uh, uh, place where the worst uh, offenders, the worst resistors uh, were put. There were 11 of them that were placed in Alcatraz altogether. Sam Johnson would have been one of them. To get a ticket to Alcatraz, you had to be a difficult prisoner uh, and a strong resistor. Current ambassador from the United States to Vietnam, Pete Peterson, yeah. former congressman. Um, interestingly, Peterson does not play a prominent part in the book. We don't mention him to any large extent and for some reason you don't get a lot of um, reading on him in the after action reports but in interviews uh, we know that Peterson was very much uh, respected and admired by Sam Johnson and by the other tough resistors so he too had a very strong record. Uh, although he's, not, he's one of those who's not mentioned nearly as prominently as Sam Johnson or Swindle or, or uh, some of the others you mentioned in, in the book. Former vice presidential candidate on the Ross Perot ticket, James Stockdale. Right. Well, Stockdale, um, by all accounts, uh, uh, I think uh, even when compared with Denton and the other leaders, probably the most respected of the POWs. Congressional Medal of Honor winner uh, who was willing to slash his wrists and uh, uh, kill himself before giving uh, uh, information on the communication system at, uh, uh, at Walla, at, uh, the, at the Hilton, and uh, in this particular compound called Vegas at the Hilton. Um, Stockdale, who also was very important in terms of developing a version of the code of conduct, a rendering of it, an interpretation of it that would be um, uh, conveyed and communicated throughout the whole prison system that was considered a reasonable, commonsensical approach to how much torture they would be, the, the men, uh, the POWs could be expected to take. 
uh, attitudes about, uh, you know, do you have to escape, uh, do you have to try to escape even if it means risking your life and the lives of others. How long is the code? Uh, well, the, the, the code of conduct, of course, which is what, what uh, Stockdale's and, and for that matter others, other leader, other senior leaders um, uh, instruction are based on, uh, is, is, a, is a rather short code of conduct. Uh, Based on the it came after the Korean experience, uh, uh, the basic concept was stick to the stick to the the big four: your name, uh, your rank, serial number, uh, date of birth. Stockdale developed something. It was a system called uh, uh, he used the acronym BACUS, which dealt with some of the main um, uh, experiences that the POWs would face and and and, and how they. Should should deal with those experiences. Uh, the B stood for bow. Don't bow, at least not in public, in any kind of a televised public uh, display where the uh, Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, would be trying to show the Americans to be obsequious and uh, uh, sub in a submitted, uh, in a, in a um, uh, submissive pose. Uh, the A stood for air. Don't go on the air. Don't tape. Don't go on the radio. At least try your utmost not to take torture up to a certain point. Uh, uh, if, if you can no longer withstand it without feeling you were losing a limb or your life, give something, but give something that would not be significant. Certainly don't betray any uh, comrades, don't betray the organization system in the prisons or the communication system. Um, the C stood for crime in this BACUS uh, acronym. Uh, don't admit to any crimes. Uh, uh, the, the, the K stood for kiss, uh, which was uh, don't kiss the ring if they offer you early release. Um, if they uh, 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 appear to be magnanimous and are trying to pose as humane and lenient, don't, um, uh, don't thank them for that. Uh, and the important us, the unity over self, which was the basis of the whole system. And I should say that Stockdale was not the only one who contributed to this code. Denton. Uh, contributed as well. At certain points, Stockdale would be at a commission, and Denton or, or uh, Robinson Risner would be uh, the, the, the senior in a particular situation at a certain time. And they'd also developed certain incremental uh, uh, additions to this code of conduct uh, as to what was expected of, of, of the prisoners. And at the end, I should mention John Flynn, who was the, the, the top-ranking senior uh, Air Force uh, colonel. Uh, who was very important toward, uh, in a later point in the captivity, in kind of consolidating this guidance uh, and this code of behavior. In the back, you have a chart that shows that there were 4,100 POWs in World War I, 130,000 in World War II, 7,100 in Korea, 771 in Vietnam, 23 in the Persian Gulf. Uh, how were the prisoners of war in Vietnam treated compared to those other wars? Right. Well, in terms of the treatment, we make the point that, and we don't get into a lot of comparison, but we do make the point in the beginning uh, where we try to put this in context that uh, no wars have been uh, hospitable to uh, uh, the prisoners of war. And uh, in some cases, the Korean treatment was, and even during World War II, uh, was as brutal or more brutal than what was experienced by the prisoners in Vietnam. Um, however, I think what was really significant here is the longevity. This is the, these guys uh, were the longest held POWs in American history. So they were, uh, uh, this was uh, over a decade, uh, or, or, or during the course of a decade for some who were POWs, almost a decade, Alvarez, uh, Floyd Thompson, Jim Thompson in the South, called the Old Man in the South, who was captured in 64, uh, and who came out in 73. Uh, these were guys who, who uh, POWs had, had underwent repeated instances of, of, of torture and of course just having to withstand uh, some very difficult conditions in terms of uh, the climate, in terms of uh, uh, sanitation, and, uh, hygiene, uh, uh, malnutrition over a period of time. So certainly they have to, to rank right up there with the guys who survived uh, uh, the worst abuses and, and in particular the uh, uh, most difficult uh, conditions over a long period of time.
I counted in the back in appendix two, 15 prisons in North Vietnam. Uh, if I've got them, I may be off one or two. Um, how many were there in South Vietnam? In South Vietnam, there were not so many uh, prisons as simply locations, uh, often jungle stockades. Uh, the, the captivity in the South was more of an itinerant, nomadic kind of captivity, where often just one or two prisoners in a cluster. Uh, later on, more would be brought, on, brought together. But during much of the, uh, the period of captivity in the South, you did not have formal uh, enclosed prison structures as such, as much as you had uh, uh, camps that would be moved every few days and stockades would be set up with, with, with cages. Um, and we make the point in the book, uh, and I think one of the real contributions to the book is that we discuss not only the, the stories of the, the, the pilots at the Hanoi Hilton, but the experience of these, um, uh, in many cases, lower-ranking enlisted men, Marines and Army enlisted that were captured in the South and who had to go endure this itinerant captivity that isn't discussed in any other books, to our knowledge. Uh, and in many cases had, had, in some ways, a lonelier, uh, certainly, but also a uh, more um, challenging experience because they had to deal more with the elements being outdoors, in, uh, often in a jungle or a mountainous jungle uh, location where there would be uh, 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 leeches and scorpions and snakes uh, and having to deal with uh, uh, probably a more uh, precarious uh, uh, food and water situation as well. So the guys in the South uh, also withstood uh, the ones who survived at uh, tremendous ad adversity as well as the better known cases of the uh, Dentons and the Stockdales in the North. Who is Dieter Dingler and what's his story? Dengler was a naval uh, aviator who uh, was captured, um, I believe, in 65, somewhere in the uh, fairly early, maybe it might have been 64, actually I think 65 probably, in Laos. Um, and uh, Dengler was an interesting case because there were very few, very few POWs who got out of Laos alive, uh, even at the end of the war at homecoming, only nine. POWs came out of uh, out of uh, out of Laos. I mean, out, out of uh, a total number. Oh, out of a total number. Uh, well, we don't know. See, the, the, there's the big question about MIAs and, and and the big mystery about how many were ever in the prison system, really is in the case of Laos. We just don't know because they were held singly, uh, in very isolated cases. Um, they would be uh, one or two would be held in a in a cave, and um, we know a lot of guys went down in good parachutes when uh, uh, there are at least 300 cases where guys were downed in Laos appeared to be in a position to survive and to become prisoner but we only know of nine that that uh, came out in 1973 and several who escaped uh, including Dengler uh, along the way um, uh, uh, Dengler is uh, had a phenomenal story, and it's told in a, um, a book that he's he's written. Um, it's so phenomenal, a lot of the analysts who reviewed it were not sure of its accuracy, and he it, partly because Dengler had been so dehydrated and may have been hallucinating, and was not sure himself of exactly what he experienced. In any case, um, he did manage to get out. He managed to. Um, uh, escape uh, along with several others who were in this one group. Uh, uh, he was the only one. Uh, Duane Martin was an Army helicopter pilot uh, who joined Dengler in this escape. Um, and we know d that Martin died along the way uh, when they encountered some, uh, um, I believe it was villagers with machetes. And uh, Martin was killed uh, along the way. A very interesting case, and what remains a discrepancy case, is uh, the case of uh, Jean de Brune, who went out with Dengler, and who has never been, uh, his, his body's never been recovered. We don't know what happened to him. We just know that he didn't make it out. There were reports along the way that de Brune uh, would be spotted in a certain site, a certain area in Laos, but he, he did not come out in 1973, and he was, he's one of the remaining really intriguing discrepancy cases. Uh, de Brune's brother, 
uh, Jerome de Bruyne is a professor at the University of Toledo who has made it his uh, life's work to, uh, for the remainder of his life, to try to find, get more information on de Bruyne. But uh, we, we don't know what happened. De Bruyne didn't make it out, but Dengler did, and uh, just apparently as he was, um, he was on a mountaintop and uh, had just about uh, run out of food, he was eating frogs, uh, he was eating leaves, and finally uh, he was spotted by a rescue uh, aircraft and uh, taken out. How many people uh, did you talk to for this book? Um, we talked to um, uh, over a hundred of the POWs, uh, as well as many um, analysts with the Defense Intelligence Agency. Um, uh, we talked with a family of uh, POWs, including some who uh, did not come back, um, and also uh, one interesting case, the brother of uh, Al Brudno, who uh, was one of two who committed suicide. Uh, Al Brudno uh, killed himself after coming back, a very tragic case, one of the great heroes of the resistance, and uh, a fine person who was unable to uh, uh, adapt to um, a broken marriage and uh, some difficulty after he came back. So we talked to family members, we talked to many of the POWs. Uh, my co-author, Fred Kiley, did most of the interviews, and I should say that Kiley is, is uh, you know, I, I believe, the foremost um, uh, authority in this country on U.S. POWs. Uh, Fred did most of the research for the work and uh, uh, has encyclopedic knowledge based on his interviews with the prisoners as well as his review of the, of the literature. How did you divide your responsibilities for the book? Um, Fred did most of the research, in fact, over a period of almost 10 years when we started this project. I came along f later in the game after Fred had actually started the project. Uh, Fred had gotten uh, sidetracked by some other responsibilities at the National Defense University where he had heads up their, headed up their publication program and their research program. I picked up the book from Fred. Uh, Fred had drafted a number of chapters, had done this massive research. And um, I did a good deal of the writing of the later chapters and worked with Fred to fin complete the drafts of the early chapters. So. What do you say to someone listening uh, who says, this man works for the Defense Department, we're getting the Pentagon version of the POW? Well, we hear that from time to time. And um, uh, all I can say is that there was absolutely uh, no, there were no constraints and no inhibitions on us at, at all. Um, aside from the normal security review uh, of sensitive issues that any author would have to uh, uh, be subjected to before that information could be published. Um, I work in a uh, history office, really largely of academics, and fortunately we do have free reign pretty much to interpret things as we want to, uh, with regard to our other books as well as, uh, as this one. Published by the Naval Institute Press, what is that? Is that connected with the government? No, the Naval Institute Press is a, is a private uh, press and um, in no way connected with the government. Uh, uh, there are absolutely is no, no uh, official imprimatur. In fact, we've alienated <laughs> as many uh, of the members of the military as we've, as we've pleased with this book. Uh, we, I think it's a good test of the candor and the balance and the objectivity of it is that uh, some of the POWs like it and some don't. Some of the government uh, officials think it's a terrific uh, peon to the um, uh, success and performance of the military, and others think we were too harsh. What would the, the um, what would the POWs not like about the book? The ones that have complained. Uh, the ones that complain feel that uh, there are a couple instances where they say we got a fact wrong, a date wrong. Although to, to an amazing extent, most of them say we could. We nailed it right on the head and we got it right. But there's some who will say, you know, you didn't get this exactly right. There's some who feel that we were maybe a little bit too critical of, the, of their individual performance, didn't give them enough credit. Um, uh, I don't want to betray any confidences, but there were, there were a couple um, who believed that we were um, uh, not, not fair to them. Uh, we feel we were. Uh, we feel the memoirs sometimes are a little too self-serving, so we were careful to use the memoirs advisedly and to always base our conclusions on, on, on uh, corroborated statements. And How many books have been written by POWs? Uh, probably 
about two dozen good memoirs. Um, many of them uh, are superficial, but there's some excellent, excellent ones out there. Alvarez has a has a, a memoir uh, that's that's pretty good. The best one, to my knowledge, is uh, Jerry Coffey's uh, memoir. Uh, Denton has one called "When Hell Was in Session." Nick Rowe, uh, who was another uh, case of an, uh, someone who escaped from the South, and, uh, in Rowe's case, has an excellent memoir called Five Years to Freedom." Uh, there are about two dozen of them out there. There are very few books about the POWs. Very few books such as this, which, which deal with the POWs of a non-memoir type, and in any kind of a comprehensive way, and that deal with the South and Laos, as well as with, with the North, and with civilians. Uh, we also deal with about 60 uh, civilians uh, who were captured in this book. There, there are sentences uh, like this that uh, jump out throughout the entire book, and I'll just read it so you can explain how much of this went on. This is uh, in the chapter on Dirty Bird and Alcatraz, a couple of the prisons. Food consisted of pumpkin or cabbage soup, sometimes with a piece of pig fat floating in it. The lack of protein and poor sanitation left the PWs, that's short for POW, vulnerable to the usual infections, parasites, and diarrhea. Typical was the incident described in Rutledge's memoir where Jenkins awoke one night with what he thought was a piece of string in his mouth that turned out to be a six-inch worm. Right. They were routinely afflicted with uh, dysentery, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, worms. Uh, uh, in the South, again, uh, even worse conditions because of the lack of fruit and vegetables altogether. Berry, berry, scurvy type of diseases. Uh, in the North, they did have at least occasional access to, even if it was rotten, some fruits and vegetables, pumpkin. Um, uh, w one new arrival came and uh, was delighted to see that there was actually some rye bread on his plate until he noticed that the seeds were starting to move. Uh, there was very, very little in the way of, of uh, palatable food except during holidays. Uh, and, uh, and toward the end, when they were being fattened up, so that at the time of release they would, would look better and would reflect the, 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 the so-called alleged humane and lenient treatment that the Vietnamese had uh, uh, maintained that they had always extended to the POWs. Here's a, just a, you have a lot of pictures like this where you have six former POWs and the fellow up there in the left-hand corner is Harlan Chapman, uh, I just noticed because you had 100 interviews, he wasn't interviewed, and it led me to ask you whether or not some of the POWs wouldn't be interviewed for this. Right. Book. How did you pick the ones? Uh, well, Fred Kiley again did most of the interviewing, and he would know better than I whether there were those who who objected or or rejected the opportunity to be interviewed. As far as I know, there was no one who turned down the opportunity. Fred was trusted because he was uh, Air Force and had served in Vietnam. He had been an advisor there for the uh, Vietnamese Air Force in 1968-69. Kylie knew a lot of the POWs. In some ways, Fred and I had a certain, there was a dynamic and a certain tension between us where Fred was usually, in some of these cases where we were wondering how, uh, how uh, uh, effective the guys were at resistance or to how, how staunch they were in their resistance, Fred would be sort of willing to give the guy the benefit of the doubt. I think I brought some detachment to the process of, of evaluating the POWs, some academic detachment. So I think it was a good balance between Fred's um, insider knowledge of these guys and my, my detachment. And I think that helped us to come up with a pretty good balanced and objective view of them. Here's another line in the book, and I, just, I was taking these out of context. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but the atmosphere was changing for the worse. By November, for starters, food rations at the zoo were cut drastically, and kitchen staff were no longer washing off the human fertilizer the Vietnamese used for their crops. A lot of reference to human feces being in in rice, uh, you know, all over these cells. How much explain the human fertilizer business? Right. Well, it was a fact of life, uh, and in the South, in fact. Um you know the conditions of the, the food was so bad that oftentimes the um, you know the Vietnamese themselves were eating this this tainted stuff. Um, uh, the uh, uh, Denton makes the point that uh, at one point one of the uh, I think it's Cat who is the head of the 
prison system, North Vietnamese prison system, says, do you know you're eating shit? And Denton's, Denton, who was as tough as they come, would say, uh, does it have any protein in it? Somehow they adapted. They were able to do this. They were able to down this stuff and eat it um, with problems with disease. Uh, some, of, some of them died from disease. In fact, most of the, there were about 100 POWs who died um, during the course of the captivity, during the course of a decade, and most of them from disease, dysentery, uh, malaria, beriberi, uh, uh, food problems, and so forth, stomach problems, uh, rather than from torture. Um, but uh, yeah, this was uh, this was the condition. Uh, this was was, was the uh, uh, there was. I'm trying to think of another instance where, uh, in fact, uh, they would use fertilizer for their own garden, and uh, they would later uh, uh, eat the food. They didn't have access to clean water, and oftentimes no water at all. So um, uh, it was one of the uh, elements that they had to deal with. The names David Dellinger, Tom Hayden, Jane Fonda, Mary McCarthy, uh, others, the strike, women's strike for peace, uh, come up when they visited over there. In retrospect from all these years, what impact did those people have on the prisoners only over there when they would go visit? Right. Well, uh, the impact would, would vary. Uh, usually, the, uh, when the Dellingers or the, the Haydens would come over there, uh, uh, the prisoners, on the one hand, would often be trotted out with trays of cookies and in a fairly nice circumstance. So they might get a break in terms of some decent food and uh, a break from, from monotony. Uh, but at the same time, they were being exploited for the purposes of uh, uh, showing uh, uh, the humane and lenient side of the Vietnamese. And uh, the Haydens and the others would go back to the United States and, and say that uh, these guys are being treated uh, fine. There's no reason for concern. So um, it was a, uh, uh, I mean, the effect of them being over there was to really enhance the propaganda uh, uh, campaign of the uh, North Vietnamese. And um, uh, it angered the POWs tremendously. Also, when they would hear Jane Fonda or Hayden on the radio uh, spouting about the uh, American imperialists and the Vietnamese being so uh, humane and lenient in the treatment of their prisoners, giving the wrong, wrong impression. Um, Risner had a real pr problem with uh, Mary McCarthy when she was a... Who, who is Risner? Uh, Robinson Risner, who was the uh, Air Force... Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, and uh, along with Denton and Stockdale, uh, uh, one of the leaders of the, uh, the POWs, one of the senior, senior ranking officers. Uh, Risner is an interesting case because he was uh, exploited probably as much as any of the senior officers. He would be trotted out for these interviews with uh, uh, the uh, uh, visiting journalist. And he would be asked to tape on the radio because he was well known. He had been the subject of a Time magazine article. He was an ace, a Korean War ace, uh, and they exploited him mercilessly. They even would trot Risner out for these early release ceremonies where they would release some of the POWs. And uh, he became a part of the pageant. And of course, it frustrated him greatly. And he underwent uh, a tremendous, I think, psychological uh, uh, suffering. Uh, uh, as well as spending a lot of time in solitary also during portions of his uh, uh, captivity. So Risner endured a, a, an awful lot uh, uh, along with Stockdale and the other, other seniors. Everett Alvarez, you mentioned earlier, who was the longest serving in the North, uh, wrote things like this. The pain was excruciating. They, um, I've, it felt like a hacksaw had stuck deep in my flesh. The cuffs seemed to cut off to the bone. My head was pushed forward, and all I could do was yell and scream to ride out the pain. They left me alone for a quarter hour spells and then returned, yanking my arms up and squeezing the cuffs tighter yet. The worse it got, the louder I shrieked. The more I howled, the more they slapped and punched. JC preferred to strike from behind 
but when he came from uh, in front of it, it was always the underside of his closed fist. My eyes felt like popping. My veins wanted to explode in a gush of boiling blood. JC was joined by Ichabod Crane, a spindly 6'2 turnkey with a drooping head, blazing dra draconian eyes and clothes that were too short and tight-fitting. Together they worked me over heartlessly like a couple of kids pulling wings off flies. Later on, he says, it would be two years before they would regain their natural color, meaning his hands. Many guys came out with uh, injuries that never healed, uh, back injuries, uh, leg injuries, uh, uh, of course, all kinds of scars and other, other effects. Uh, the, the ratchet cuffs were, were uh, another uh, very uh, difficult uh, thing for them to handle, along with the rope torture. Um, uh, sometimes the, the degree, the severity of the torture would be inadvertent. Uh, the Vietnamese didn't realize that at times they were, they were using small, they were used to, uh, they were using some cuffs and manacles that had been used on Vietnamese prisoners. It tended to be a lot, uh, had smaller wrists, and so these things tended to be a lot of smaller dimension. And so the Americans, even when these things would be clamped on and were not ratcheted, uh, it caused tremendous pain that the Vietnamese didn't even realize. So um, using uh, manacles and shackles that were often very con constricted, to begin with, because they were downsized to, uh, originally to suit their the smaller the, the dimensions of the Vietnamese prisoners, created pain from the beginning, and then these things would be ratcheted. Uh, What's yeah. this? Uh, that's a picture of uh, it's a matrix of what was called the the, the tap code, which was the um, probably the primary form of communication. It's a five by five uh, matrix of the alphabet. Uh, containing all the letters except the letter K, for which they substituted uh, the letter C. Uh, and they used this matrix and they could rotate the letters uh, in a way that in which they were able to tap almost any kind of a message, often using an abbreviated form. Uh, for example, uh, one of the early sign-offs that appears in almost all the messages was, God bless you, as they're talking to, uh, messaging to one another. And uh, the, the G would be in the second line, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It's the it's second uh, row and the second vertical column, so it would be a 2-2. Two, two. Uh, the B would be 1-2, uh, second uh, row, uh, first row across, second row uh, down. And they, they got to the point where they could do this uh, uh, with almost kind of a... Uh, blinding kind of a speed, and they were able to use a system of, uh, of, of tapping either through the wall, or they could apply it, as Denton did, to sneezes and coughs, or even sweeping with a broom. Uh, Go back and, to the sneeze just a second, because uh, you, you point out in here that when they would sneeze, they would also say some rather strong things. Yeah. Signaling the entire camp that uh, what they had a sense of humor or they what was it's a reason? lot of humor. There's a lot of humor in the book. It's black humor often, but they were sustained by humor, and they each would have kind of a signature sneeze in which they would you know go oh, bullshit you know or or you know or or worse you know obscenities in their sneezes. And some strong um, things to say about Ho Chi Minh. Right. Uh, they would typically uh, garble the name Ho Chi Minh, uh, and it would come out horseshit. Uh, men. Uh, one of their real nemeses was an Australian journalist named Wilfred Burchett, communist journalist, who uh, would, uh, was writing uh, pieces around the world about how terrific the Vietnamese were and how uh, evil and uh, uh, imperialistic the POWs and the American military was. And uh, whenever they would be forced to read on the radio, I mentioned Al Brudno, he was one of those who would uh, garble the sound of, of Wilfred Burchett's name. It would come out well-fed bullshit. Uh, uh, there was a lot of that sort of thing. Um, Kyle Berg uh, was, uh, he's a, a Navy, uh, I'm sure Berg was Navy or Air Force, but he was noted for his humor uh, and uh, oftentimes would entertain the other POWs with various kinds of stick or things that he would do. There was a guard who, on one occasion, a, a guard who wanted to learn some English and um, an English expression. And so uh, Kyle Berg decided to teach him an English expression. He said, whenever you get up in the morning and you want to say hello, you know, 
uh, and he knew some Vietnamese, he was explaining that hello is, is I'm queer. You say I'm queer. So this one guard was very proud of this English city. He learned would get up in the, uh, every morning for weeks, would uh, go from cell to cell and say I'm queer, I'm queer. So it, it was the kind of hijinks, the kind of uh, uh, light touch that occasionally, uh, in between torture, uh, uh, would, uh, would, would lighten the mood and, and sustain them over a period of time. Who was tortured, uh, or it doesn't have to be one, the, the most though, that they, you know, we read just a little bit of this, but they went beyond what we've read. Well, uh, probably the two worst torture cases would be um, the uh, case of Edward, uh, uh, Ad Edwin Atterbury, um, and the case of uh, Cobiel, these are two Air Force uh, POWs. Um, Atterbury uh, made a mistake of trying to escape with uh, John Dramisi, another Air Force, uh, Air, I think Dramisi was an Air Force major. Uh, this would have been in 1969, spring of 1969. Atterbury and uh, Dramisi uh, had an elaborate escape plan, a good plan actually. Uh, although uh, uh, no one ended up successfully escaping from the north. You could escape from the prison maybe, but they would, would usually be able to find you after a short while. And, and uh, Atterbury uh, and Dramisi were captured soon after getting out of the zoo annex in the spring of 69, which turned out to be a terrible thing for the other prisoners who took tremendous uh, punishment and retaliation. But uh, uh, the worst case was uh, Atterbury, who was put in a torture cell and I would say in the book, a uh, description of, the, of what he underwent, the shrieks that were heard uh, from the equivalent of blocks, several blocks, city blocks away. Uh, and he died in that torture cell. One of the very few cases where a man was tortured to death. And uh, that was in uh, uh, direct retaliation for that escape effort. Uh, Dramisi also took terrible punishment but survived. And some of the other POWs took, took awful punishment. Gene McDaniel, Red McDaniel, took uh, 700 lashes. There was even some electroshock treatment, uh, that, which they didn't usually resort to. This is the uh, same Red McDaniel that we have seen since then, very active in the POW right. issue. Yes, who Red is, continues to be very active on the MIA and the POW issue. Uh, McDaniel took tremendous punishment uh, because he was a senior in the zoo area, in that complex. And the POWs assumed that all this had been orchestrated, that the, the Dramisi Atterbury escape had been organized and directed by the seniors, which really wasn't the case. Dramisi pretty much went on his own. Uh, and, and although he finally got the order that it was okay to go, there was a lot of reluctance on the part of, uh, actually it was Conrad Troutman, who you mentioned earlier, who was a senior, who said, okay, you want to try it, go ahead. But there was, would always be the concern that if the guy didn't make it, uh, or, or for that matter, even if he did make it, uh, the repercussions for the guys that were left, left behind who would be punished uh, uh, in, uh, in retaliation for that. The other case and was... And that came true. And it came true. Uh, there were, in every camp for, for two months, there was... Uh, it, it was probably the worst sustained torture period uh, would have been in the spring and summer of 69 at uh, every one of the camps in the north. Uh, and again, there were these four or five main prisons. So not only the zoo and the zoo annex, but at, uh, uh, at Walla, at Noy Hilton, uh, at uh, the, the plantation, uh, Sante, and uh, all the other camps in the north. Uh, the other case, the severe torture case, would have been Earl Cobiel, who was a victim of what was called the Cuban uh, program. Fidel. And, uh, the Fidel program, yeah. I mean, uh, Fidel was a... Uh, to explain who he was. Okay, well, we still don't know exactly who Fidel was. It's one of the remaining mysteries of the POW story. We think uh, that uh, Fidel was a, a Cuban, a Spaniard of some type, probably Cuban from his appearance, from the language, uh, shows up one day along with a, a, an entourage of a few other Cubans, some of whom came a little bit later, uh, showed up at uh, uh, the zoo in, uh, this would have been in 19... Uh, 67, 68, somewhere in there. Um, Fidel shows up rather suddenly, and he's given all kinds of special uh, uh, deferential treatment by the Vietnamese. It's, it's hard to tell whether he is a superior, considered a communist superior to the Vietnamese, or the Vietnamese are just indulging this foreign visitor. But he's given kind of free reign for about two months. 
Actually, the Cuban program would extend almost uh, almost a course of a year uh, with about 20 POWs, two groups of, uh, I think, 10 each who were taken out of the zoo annex and put in a special part of the compound. And uh, Fidel uh, was uh, uh, able to... It's hard to tell exactly what the purpose of the program was. It, it appears that uh, it was a program to kind of turn out Manchurian candidates for early release, uh, to punish guys so severely and indoctrinate them to the extent that uh, they could be prepped for early release and then would just be just recite the Vietnamese, the communist line when they got out. Uh, we're not sure exactly again. We don't know the details of this program because no one has ever determined Fidel's identity or the Cuban's identity because they left after a year. And DIA analysts have been trying to track this guy for years, trying to locate him. All we know is that several of the, of the POWs in this program, in particular Code Beale, uh, were viciously um, uh, tortured in kind of an alternation of carrot and stick over a period of time. Cobiel's mistake, uh, this is Earl Cobiel, Air Force uh, Major, I believe, uh, was to uh, be in bad shape to begin with, and Fidel assumed that he was, that Cobiel was faking uh, insanity. And uh, he said, we've got a faker here, and he just continued to beat the hell out of the guy in session after session until Cobiel was mindless, was, was just completely numb, didn't know where he was, who he was, uh, could not eat. Uh, he had to be force-fed by uh, some of the others at the zoo. And he would die uh, uh, sometime later, about a year or two later, from what was one of the severest torture episodes. You say that the average age of the 800 was 39, that their rank was 04, meaning major or lieutenant commander, that they were fathers of three children on average. They spent 45 months in confinement and six to 12 months in solitary confinement. What, what was the solitary confinement like? And who served the longest in solitary? All right. Well, the solitary was uh, the worst kind of solitary with darkness and a small cell, uh, often with uh, vermin and rats and things that you could hear but could not see. Um, occasionally you might be let out for a half hour a day. Uh, the only break would be getting, receiving uh, food, usually two meals a day, around 10 o'clock and 3 o'clock. Um, the longest that were held in solitary would have been probably the seniors Denton, uh, Stocktail, and Risner. Um, uh, ben uh, Purcell, uh, who was an Army major in the South, spent a long time in solitary. Ernie Brace, a civilian captured in Laos. Uh, also spent a long time in uh, solitary. Um, solitary required uh, uh, as much as anything, obviously, a ability to, to cope, to distract yourself, to kill time, to uh, uh, not to, uh, or in some way to survive what Red McDaniel called the inner, the inner struggle, the mental struggle that all the POWs really had to go through. We were, torture ha occurred fairly regularly, but there were long periods in between where the real challenge was to just to mentally uh, stay together and survive just the, uh, the monotony of the routine and the boredom, and particularly in solitary. You use that time in solitary either to uh, restore yourself physically by just kind of walking and pacing back and forth. Who's on the cover? Uh, good question. I don't know. This is the cover that uh, the Naval Institute Press chose to use. Um, it is a photograph or a rendering of a photograph that appeared at the uh, in an exhibit at the Capitol and Capitol Building, I believe, in 1970 that Ross Perot had organized. And I am not sure myself who that is. Uh, it's, it is a worst-case scenario of obviously the prisoner who had undergone uh, tremendous punishment and malnutrition. What does this book cost? Uh, book cost uh, thirty six dollars and fifty cents, I believe. Yeah. Seven hundred pages, uh, lots of illustrations, uh, fifty pages of documentation, um, and uh, a good read as well as we think a uh, uh, an expert uh, uh, analysis. Where is this area. photograph from? Uh, that's a photograph of the POWs on one of the aircraft finally taking off from. Uh, from Hanoi uh, in probably February or March 1973. They were 
uh, stoic almost up to that point. They were told not to show any emotion until they got on the plane, not to give the Vietnamese any, any satisfaction. Uh, uh, and they were also pretty enervated by that time. But that's a group that uh, finally, when they realized they were, were, were leaving captivity, some of them perhaps after seven or eight years, just let it all out and, uh, in, in absolute joy and elation. You say in the book that um, the returnee debriefings have been kept confidential. Did you see them and did you use any of the, that information in the book? Yeah. We, uh, we did see the debriefings, not all of them, but, but many of them. Um, we could not quote directly from them, uh, even in paraphrasing. We had to be very careful what we used. Uh, but we, uh, the real value of the debriefings was in just kind of informing us and giving us a sense of uh, what a Stockdale or, or a Risner uh, had experienced so that we could better judge their memoirs and the published literature. Uh, but the debriefings are considered confidential, and uh, we respected that uh, confidence uh, uh, as well as even other POWs who want to see others' debriefings are not, not really allowed to get, to get to use those. Senator John McCain, what kind of a prisoner was he? McCain was uh, unquestionably a uh, hard resistor, hard line, uh, courageous, uh, tremendous fortitude uh, just to have survived his initial injuries on his shoot down. McCain landed up in, landed in prison, landed in Hanoi after a, a shoot down in as probably bad a condition as any prisoner who, who survived a, a crash or a shoot down, a bailout. He had a bad back, he had broken legs, arms, um, would be in cast for much of his, his captivity, in fact. Uh, he almost drowned, in fact, on uh, landing in Hanoi, landed in a lake in, uh, in the city and uh, with his equipment on. Somehow, despite his injuries, got out of the lake. Uh, uh, ended up at the plantation and uh, would resist uh, uh, indoctrination and resisted interrogation. Uh, the Vietnamese knew that he was the son of an admiral, Admiral McCain in the Pacific. Uh, they knew they had a prize. They tried desperately to get him to tape or to write something that they could use for propaganda purposes. He refused. He was punished uh, repeatedly somehow recovered from his injuries with the, the help of a couple cellmates who, who nursed him along and um, would become one of the leaders in the resistance. And last question to you, um, where did you get the title, Honor Bound? Uh, we decided on Honor Bound just because it had uh, a, uh, it captured both concepts of uh, the captivity, they're being uh, bound, but also uh, the importance of honor. That was the key thing, to retain your honor, to observe the good of conduct. And as the, the uh, their symbolic phrase uh, was, to return with honor. Stuart yeah. Rochester, along with uh, your co-author, Frederick Kiley, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And there were some who found other tortures to be more um, uh, 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 vicious and more difficult to tolerate. Uh, How many do you think went through the rope torture? Um, between 1960, the so-called middle years, which were the most difficult ones, uh, when the torture program was um, fairly regularly practiced to extract information and uh, also for punishment purposes, most of the POWs had at least one session in, in the ropes. Uh, uh, and later on, as you get toward the end of the, the uh, captivity period closer to homecoming, fewer and fewer of them would be subjected to, to the, uh, uh, the rope torture. But there were many others. Bud Day, who, is, who won the Congressional Medal of Honor and who um, uh, was as tough a nut as anyone over there, as tough a resistor, uh, and had as much fortitude and strength as anyone, uh, Bud Day had uh, the most problem with what was called the kneeling torture, where they would simply have to kneel for long periods of time often on a pebble or a stone. And as he said in his memoir, try that sometime for, for, for four or five hours and see what it feels like. And Day had more problems with that than with the ropes. We're showing a little bit of this picture. Uh, this was not Bud Day, it was uh, Ev Alvarez. Where is this picture and who was he? 
Alvarez, uh, of course, is famous as the, the so-called old man of the North. He was the first uh, pilot uh, captured uh, over North Vietnam in August of 1964. So uh, Alvarez would have been there almost a decade altogether. He came out in 1973. At this point, uh, I think we're, it's probably around 1966 or 67, Alvarez is being uh, taken through, uh, through the town. They often would take prisoners through um, uh, on kind of a tour of either bomb, bombed out sites uh, as part of the indoctrination process. Um, they would take prisoners, uh, quote, out on the town. Uh, many of the POWs actually welcomed this as at least a change of pace from the quote from Troutman probably was in an after action report that uh, we had received, although Troutman was interviewed by my co-author, uh, Fred Kiley, who, knows Tr who knew Troutman personally. Um, Troutman was one of the uh, uh, seniors uh, at, and one of the uh, senior ranking officers at the zoo, uh, one of the camps that was located about three miles uh, southwest of, of Hanoi. Um, and the passage that you're referring to is one in which I think Troutman gives a good summary of the, what, of the, the torture experience, particularly the rope torture, um, in which he describes how they were literally strung, uh, with their, strung up from the ceiling with their arms kind of behind their back and uh, cinched up uh, to the point where their arms, where they almost, uh, their shoulders were almost dislocated in some cases they would be, uh, and uh, 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 they would be put through this periodically uh, in two or three uh, sessions. Um, and it was one of the worst of the, of the tortures. Uh, some were maimed uh, in the process. Um, few got through it without giving up some information, without in some ways uh, giving the enemy what he wanted. How many prisoners of war were there during the Vietnam War? Uh, altogether about 800. Uh, there were uh, 800 at least documented cases of uh, POWs. There are a number of discrepancy cases where we're not sure if a guy was perhaps uh, captured for, uh, for a few hours uh, and escaped. Uh, he may have been held just very briefly caught in an ambush and got away immediately. Some of those are, are counted on certain lists, but basically about 800 uh, altogether. Let me read Captain Conrad Troutman, 1967. Let me try to tell you what it really feels like when they tightly bind your wrists and elbows behind your back with nylon straps. Then take the strap and pull the arms up. up. Uh, monotony of uh, being in their cell for uh, all but uh, 20, 22 hours a day. Uh, but Alvarez in that, in that photo shot is, is out on a, a, a one of those, I think, uh, tours around the city. Let me ask you about people that we know of because they've been in the public spotlight since then. Jeremiah Denton was a senator from Alabama for a while. Right. Uh, Denton uh, was uh, one of the top-ranking seniors. Um, he uh, was captured early in the war um, in, uh, I believe, 1965. Uh, Denton had a reputation, even among the seniors, as being one of the strictest and uh, one of the staunchest in terms of his adherence to the code of conduct and requiring that the others adhere to it. And every now and then, Denton will get into some conflicts with Stockdale and Garino and some of the others who had a slightly different um, uh, interpretation of, uh, of the code. Um, but Denton was one of the toughest resistors. Um, he uh, was certainly one of the most admired POWs. Uh, he's the one who gives, he's the first one off the, first senior off the aircraft at homecoming and gives the uh, address on the tarmac at Clark Air Base where he says, God bless America. And what, did he, what did he have to do with the tapping code? Uh, Denton's contribution to so-called TAP code. The TAP code was a system whereby the POWs communicated, and, and Denton contributed an important new uh, nuance or aspect, uh, the so-called vocal TAP code, whereby prisoners would be able to communicate not just by a, a tapping on the wall, but through coughing or sneezing. 
and which was very important because it was very easy to disguise that form of communication in a climate in an environment in which everyone had either uh, uh, some form of malaria or some kind of, of um, uh, coughing uh, um, some kind of uh, lung disease your back to the back of your head if you can remember when you were a little boy the fooling around you did and someone grabs your hand and just twists your arm up to your back and says say uncle he does it with just one hand and this, as you remember, is a very severe pain. Well, imagine this with both arms tied tight together, elbow to elbow, wrist to wrist, and then using the leverage of his feet planted between your shoulder blades with both hands, he pulls with all his might till your arms are up and back over your head, forcing your head down between your feet, where your legs are between iron bars. The pain is literally beyond description. One more uh, little point here. Besides the pain itself, you are tied up so tight that your windpipe becomes pinched and you breathe in gasps. You're trying to gulp in air because your wind passage is being shrunken. Your throat in a matter of 30 seconds becomes completely dry. After about 10 or 15 minutes in this position, tied up so tightly, your nerves in your arms are pinched off and then your whole upper torso becomes numb. It's a relief. You feel no more pain. The breathing is still difficult, but the pain is gone. You've been anesthetized. However, when they release the ropes, the procedure works completely in reverse. It's almost like double jeopardy. You go through the same pain coming out of the ropes as you did going right, in. Right. They all describe it very similarly, the double jeopardy aspect. Uh, the, uh, the coming out of it, uh, you experience the same thing as you're going in it. Fred Kiley, the co-author, actually went through a version of that at Fort Belvoir. Uh, at their survival school here in the Washington area. Uh, I declined to do it, but Fred uh, had heard so much about the rope torture that uh, just to get the feel of it, as, as he said, uh, actually underwent, uh, underwent it and uh, uh, had very much the same sensation that, that Troutman describes. By all accounts, it was the worst of the many kinds of torture that uh, they were, were sub subjected to. Um, but curiously, some managed to get through the, um, as with all things with the POWs, what some found to be uh, the, the worst case, others found to be more tolerable. Stuart Rochester, co-author of Honor Bound, American Prisoners of War in Southeast Asia. If someone buys your book, what do they get? Well, they get a 700-page uh, book that is both a... Um, I think a, a novel, a, a story, a narrative of the experience of the prisoners of war in the in Southeast Asia, uh, and they also get an analysis, um, uh, a documented analysis of what that experience was like, and um, uh, uh, how well the POWs performed, uh, not according to uh, memoir renditions, but according to records, according to. Uh, debriefings and uh, reports and a good deal of uh, research material that we went through over a period of almost 10 years. So it's both a, uh, I think, a fascinating story as well as a uh, comprehensive scholarly uh, analysis uh, and record of uh, the performance of the POWs and uh, uh, their uh, experience, uh, uh, as well as, to some extent, getting into the problem of the MIAs, but mainly the POW issue. Yeah. Where do you work? I work at the Pentagon. I'm in uh, the history office, in the office of Secretary of Defense, which is a small uh, uh, office of about uh, three full-time professional historians. Uh, and uh, we uh, do... Um, history such as this, although normally not this type of history, more often a uh, history of the, uh, the administrative history of the work and the policies of the Secretary of Defense. And uh, we also have an archival function and uh, uh, we do papers and analyses for the secretaries and for other officials in the, in the building. As a way of getting into some of the many stories you tell about torture in here, I want to read Air Force Captain Conrad Troutman 1967, an interview he gave after the homecoming. Did he give it to you all? Uh, no, Troutman's, uh, the 